Hello, I'm Peter Clote, and this is a special edition of Straight Talk Africa. Yuweri Museveni in his own words. I recently traveled to Uganda, where I had the rare opportunity to do a sit-down interview with President Museveni. The wide-ranging topics included Uganda's commitment to peace, security and stability in Africa, and particularly in East Africa, the coronavirus pandemic, as well as democracy and the rule of law. I also saw reaction from Ugandans who disagree with how the president has ruled the country since coming to power in 1986. Over the two decades, many African countries have embraced presidential term limit in their constitutions as a transition from a one-party state to multi-party democracy. However, in recent years, coups, especially in West Africa, and term limits in East Africa have come under attack from incumbent presidents seeking to extend their tenures. Let's take a look at this VOA report. Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States, once defined democracy as a system of government, of the people by the people, for the people. But Western-style democracy, as defined by President Lincoln, is being tested across Africa, especially in countries where some of the world's longest-serving leaders continue to hold power. As of April 2022, five African heads of state had been in power for more than three decades. Teodoro Obiang Mabasongo, age 79, has been president of Equatorial Guinea since 1979. He is Africa's longest-serving leader. Paul Bia, aged 89, has been president of Cameroon since November 1982, and he is the second-longest-serving leader on the continent, with nearly 40 years in office. Yoweri Museven, age 77, the president of Uganda, has been in power since January 1986. Other long-serving leaders include Denis Sasson Gweso, age 78, President of the Republic of Congo, for 34 years. He first served from 1979 to 1992, and then from 1997 to the present. King Mswat III, age 53, is the King of Eswatini, a post he has held since April 1986. He has ruled for over 36 years. The Kingdom of Eswatini is the continent's last absolute monarch. Let's take a moment to focus on Uganda. Yoweri Museven has been elected president for six consecutive terms. The 77-year-old is one of Africa's longest-serving leaders. He won the 2021 election with 5.85 million votes, or 58.6%, while his closest challenger, Robert Kegulanyi Sentamu, also known as Bobby Wine, had 3.48 million votes, or 34.8% of the vote. Uganda's election campaigns are often marked by security forces crackdowns on opposition candidates and their supporters. Over the years, this action has raised concern about whether these elections were free, fair and credible. The Ugandan government says it tightens security during election season to ensure a peaceful outcome and unnecessary lawlessness, but critics disagree. In previous elections, opposition leader Kiza Besije ran against Mr. Museven four times and lost. What makes him seven tick? He's hugely popular. He commands a solid following, especially in rural areas. Some people say that if presidential election were held today, he would probably still win. Some analysts have suggested that weak institutions and rubber stamps parliaments make it easier for leaders like him seven to reject democracy. In December 2017, the Ugandan parliament voted to lift the age limit for the presidents, allowing Museven to rule indefinitely. He had pushed to change the constitution in 2005 to abolish the term limits. Although President Museven has presided over strong economic growth, his critics accuse of failing to tackle rampant corruption in the nation of 48 million people. In 2021, Transparency International ranked Uganda 144 out of 180 countries on the Corruption Perception Index. Political analysts say democracy is seriously at risk in Uganda because politicians can no longer trust voters to elect them. I began my conversation with President Museveni by asking him about Uganda's commitment to peace and security. We don't want to be flunkies of anybody. Now, as, as we went along, especially we who are younger, uh, had time now to elaborate more the sentiment into principles. 
and the principles we evolved were four. Number one, patriotism. You must love Uganda as a whole because you need it. You need it for the prosperity of our people. First of all, because of the market, because Uganda market is good for the producers of goods and services, irrespective of what tribe they come from. So we rejected the line of sectarianism, the tribes, religion, we rejected it. We said this is not serving our interests. Because if I am a, a cattle keeper like myself, I produce milk, I produce beef. Who are my friends? My friends are the ones who buy the meat and who buy the milk. How will you ensure prosperity? So therefore, principle number one, eventually, although initially it was sentiment, feeling, anger, but when we analyzed more, we found that it, uh, there were actual reasons, not just uh, sentiment. And number one was patriotism, love Uganda, down with sectarianism, down with the uh, politics of identity. But then, uh, we, we saw that if the African people wake up and start producing uh, goods and services, even the internal market of Uganda will not be enough if we are really serious. And that's why we say the second principle is Pan-Africanism. You must work for, for the integration of the whole of Africa. And then the third principle was uh, what we call social economic transformation, modernization. Society must go from uh, its pre-capitalist character to a modern middle class, skilled working class society, and then finally democracy. So when we push these lines, we found that we succeeded. Uh, because they attracted more followership. More followership, but also good quality followership. Both in quantity and in quality, we were doing well. So let's talk about trade and Uganda. Um, some of your officials were with the, attended a summit with regards to the European Union and African Union summit, uh, where the looked at ways where Africa's interest and European interest will be addressed. And some African countries have expressed concern that although there's an agreement, the European market appears not to be open. And then when there are processed products like coffee, cocoa, and all kinds, and processed from Africa, there are some restrictions or taxes put on them. Mm. What is your stance, Mr. President, regarding that? Well, that's... Uh the distortion, that is the distortion. Why do you uh, allow unprocessed coffee and when I process it, you, 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 you block it? What, what are you looking for? What are you saying? That means you are saying that Africa should always only produce raw materials. Don't dare to add value. That's the message. Uh, so, uh, we, we need to reject that, to, to, to point out. Of course, in the short run, we are, we, are a bit, we are a bit weak because we are fragmented. We are not one market uh, of Africa, which is huge. One point, I think we are now going to 1.5 billion people. Uh, but it's good to state our position on the one hand, and on the other hand, to work on the integration itself of our own market. Because if, if our market was integrated and acting with one command, 
then we would discipline those Europeans. Because we would be able to say, if you don't do this, we shall not now. We, we, we are begging, we are appealing, we are petitioning. We are, uh, because we are still weak on our side. We are not organized. We are not weak, but we are not well organized. Back to Uganda. Would you say your economic policies have taken root and bearing fruit and improving the lives of Ugandans and, of course, the refugees who are here in Uganda? If you trace historically, we were the first to acknowledge the role of the private sector uh, when we came into government. And uh, uh, it really helped the, the economy to grow. The inflation rate is very low. You can check the inflation rate must be like 2% or 3%. Because everything is, 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 is there, either produced locally or imported. Our push now has got three uh, qualitative uh, elements. Number one, all the homesteads must join the money economy. Uh, number two, aggressive import substitution. Because many of these imports from China, from, they can produce them here, the, 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 uh, our people. Number three, import, uh, uh, export promotion. But maybe you could also add number four, uh, science-led economy led by our own scientists. So therefore the economy will grow much faster and, and be bigger and uh, uh, more modern. I, I want to get your thoughts on the Chinese investing in Africa. Uh, sometimes they provide um, assistance, aid, uh, with Russia also some military assistance, development loans, investment, military support in countries such as Mali and the CAR. What are your thoughts about uh, these two countries partnering Africans and, you know, with loans and all that? The politically speaking, from 1917, from 1949, China and Russia have been on the side of the anti-colonial movement. I think these Western people need to be a bit, a bit serious. Uh, they have been on our side politically. Uh, when we defeated the colonies, we have no problem. We, we, we Africans forgive and forget. So we decided to 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 stay together, like with with us, who were with the British. We are members of the Commonwealth. We have, we have no problem. But for somebody to say, have a problem with China, why are you dealing with China? Ah, you, you don't know why? China was supporting me when you were disturbing me. Have you forgotten? Mr. President, let's talk about the law in Uganda. Uh, recently, you talked about elections that were held during the pandemic and all. I understand you called on some opposition leaders to meet and all that. My question is, is President Yuweri Museveni willing to meet your critics uh, and opponents to hash out, because as you said, it's patriotism and building the country together, to talk in a dialogue, to address their concerns as you move the country forward? We are meeting, we are meeting. We have uh, 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 a group called uh, iPod, Interparty advisory committee. Yeah. Like that. Okay. Uh, we have uh, some of those, a few who don't come, who don't want to come, that don't attend. Otherwise, we have been having this for the last uh, actually uh, almost ten years now. We have been having this iPod. Uh, we discuss everything. But the funding. That's how we. We got the government to fund political parties because uh, there was that problem of funding parties because the membership, because of the uh, of the culture, but also a bit of poverty. The 
the members don't contribute to the parties. So they were, they were, they were having a problem of funding. So they, they, and we, we said the government must fund them following a certain formula according to the uh, numerical strength of, of uh, the parties in parliament. So, Mr. President, uh, some of these minor parties, as you call them, are saying that the political space appears to be narrowed and that when they go about meeting their constituents or meeting their supporters, um, security agencies, including police, are used to stop them. Sometimes they are beaten, sometimes they are dispersed. How do you respond to such criticism, Mr. President? That's not true. The, 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 the friction was over the corona time. Actually, they are the ones who, who caused the second wave. So second wave of corona should be opposition wave. Should should call them corona, corona parties. We are the ones who, who, who had avoided the second wave. They are the ones who caused it because of indiscipline. If you want to demonstrate, there are free spaces like Corona Airstrip, where we have uh, celebrations, like you can go there and, uh, and, and show what you, whatever you want to show, but without interference. So that, that's how we get uh, into some friction. Otherwise, there's no, the radios, Uganda has got one of the freest uh, media in, in the world. Uh, check how many radio stations are there. They say whatever they want to say. If they break the law, they are accused in court and they fight it out. So, Mr. President, one of um, your critics um, made waves with uh, claims of torture by the military uh, and that he has um, the scars to prove it. I think his name is uh, Kakwenja Rukirabashaija and the likes. And they said they had known you to be against torture, but this is happening. So when you hear that, Mr. President, how, how do you respond to that? Well, we are, it's true that some of the people were tortured. Uh, I have got some, I've not confirmed about that one, but I, ha I have confirmed some other cases. Uh, and uh, I, I took it up with the, because you see the, Part of the problem of, of, of Africa is knowing what to do, is capacity building. We are building armies and security forces. These come with, sometimes they come with uh, traditional ideas from the village, or they get imported ideas from the, the, the former colonialists. Like, like, for instance, the police force, which was here during the colonial times. They were using those methods of torture, torture to, to make people talk, to make what. Uh, now, that culture still lingers on. Especially, especially in the police, which, which is an older, an older organization. Uh, but from the, the army, which is new, uh, they come with the village ideas. In the villages, when you steal, the, you are beaten. This is the traditional way. Mm. Uh, it, it is cultural mm. that, that, that uh, they beat you for two reasons. First of all, to make you talk. Oh, are you the one who did this? Oh, yes, I'm the one. Please don't beat me. Uh, then uh, also as a punishment now, you, you have those currents. Uh, the, the answer for those is, apart from the documents are there, the, the laws are there, the, but the sensitization, the, 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 to, 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 to tell them that, first of all, torture is not necessary. 
That was Ugandan President Yuweri Museveni speaking with me in Kampala. Now here in the studio is law professor and author Kenneth Mwanda. Kenneth, it's great to have you back on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you, Peter, and uh, pleasure as always. So, Kenneth, you heard the president of Uganda on a wide-ranging um, topics, but then he spoke about the rule of law. The opposition uh, groups say the political space is narrowed and that security agents are used to suppress them and all that. The problem sometimes becomes the president is proposing campaign at one place, don't go to the market to disrupt business activities. The opposition is saying, but we need to disrupt in order to have our messages cut across. What are your thoughts, Andrew? You know, in any democracy, uh, even in the Western world, uh, you are bound to have disagreements. The, the, the concept of politics, first of all, what is politics? Politics is characterized by conflict. If there's consensus, it's policies, not politics. So naturally, there will be conflict, uh, different uh, sector interests in society. And I'm one who doesn't want to just condemn. Uh, I would also like to give credit. Um, I think President Museveni has done some good work in terms of um, trying to fight uh, the terrorists, especially from the Horn of Africa, uh, terrorist sort of uh, disturbances and so forth. And he's gotten a lot of support from the US, uh, funding and, and so forth to support those initiatives to uh, stop uh, terrorists from the Horn of Africa. Uh, so we must give credit there. There are other areas, of course, where one would have some misgivings. Uh, for example, uh, the extent to which you tolerate uh, dissenting and opposing views, and also allegations. I call them allegations because they are, they are not yet confirmed, but they are, they are reports that you know he, he, his approach is quite heavy-handed in terms of uh, how he handles uh, dissenting views, as well as interference in politics in the neighboring region. Uh, there have been disagreements between him, I think, and President Kagame. Uh, but recently, they're sort of trying to, you know, patch fences. And I think the, the road from um, uh, Uganda into Rwanda, the border has now been opened, I think, effective right. January. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's some progress there. Um, but I see a lot when I listen to him, I can see that sort of da influence. He went to University of Dar es Salaam, mm -hmm. and I think he was taught by people like Walter Rodney from uh, you know, Guyana, who was very leftist. So I could see that if you listen to him, he spoke about the four pillars. One, patriotism. Two, pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. He came to social economic transformation. Then fourth and finally, democracy. That's economic determinism. Very sort of materialist, uh, from a dialectical materialism point of view. Mm -hmm. You know, he's trying to push that frontier. So you can see the dark influence in him. He's still there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Kenneth, yeah. when you, I asked him about regional security, right. and he mentioned these uh, four elements. Right. Now, they recently launched a joint offensive in DRC against ADF rebels. Uh, and they are trying to help stop the terrorism activities in Somalia. My question is, has Uganda played a critical role in ensuring the region is politically stable and safe for residents? Because DRC just joined the East Africa community. Yeah. I think that's not a very, um, in my humble view, I have reservations about that approach. There are only three instances in which uh, a country can get itself involved in another country's uh, politics. Uh, sort of, I'm taking the Westphalian model. One is under the UN Security Council uh, collective decision that, you know, uh, let's move in. Secondly is where countries acting uh, in self-defense, you've been attacked. Uh, and thirdly is where you've been invited by the country that is facing aggression to come and help them. There is no other basis in international law. And this is the same thing we are seeing in countries like uh, Ukraine today. Uh, even this argument, uh, there are some countries that have advanced the argument of uh, preemptory self-defense. It's, it's not an existing concept in international law, although some scholars try to justify it, uh, that we are trying to disarm terrorists, and that's why we went in. No. There are only three established grounds in customary international law supported by conventional international law, which is treaty law. UN Security Council, self-defense, and when you're invited in by the country under siege. Kenneth, looking at Uganda's political stability and, and, and security stability at the moment, the opposition groups have said that he has stayed in power for too long. Uh, some argue that 
since independence, you've not had a smooth transfer of power from one leader to the next in Uganda. And this is the longest stretch where the country remains peaceful. Your thoughts? Yeah, President Museveni came to power, I think, 1986. Mm -hmm. And... Um, then in, I think, 2005, there was a constitutional amendment to lift... Uh, first of all, there was a referendum to open it up to multi-party politics. Mm -hmm. And also there was a, an amendment, constitutional amendment, that, uh, that you know, got rid of the two-term limit, leaving it open. Another major milestone was in 2017, another constitutional amendment now to remove the age limit from 75, leaving it just open. Uh, because this is about 78, I think, this year. So that allowed him to, to stand. Uh, so we have to look at these issues in perspective. It reminds me a lot of President Kaunda in Zambia. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of that discontentment saying that he had been in power for too long and so forth. And Kaunda was, I think, less than, much less than uh, President Museveni. Um, but yes, the interesting question we need to ask ourselves, the last elections were mad with violence and so forth. Uh, but you know, it shows that he had a landslide victory. Um, perhaps one would want to find out if it's a, it's a marginal, slightly marginal win, maybe you could say, but if it's landsl landslide, then you begin to ask yourself, he probably, I would want to believe, has some support, uh, still has some support. Of course, there are people who have different views and they would like him to stay, but he seems to still have some support and legitimacy within the country. Coming up. After the break, we'll hear more of my interview with Ugandan President Yuweri Museveni. I will also hear from two Ugandans who disagree with the way he has ruled the country the last 36 years. Stay with us. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. Now let's go to the second part of my interview with President Museveni. So, Mr. President, you talked about CSOs or civil society groups in Uganda not being CSOs, calling them for it against. Why do you say so? And I've heard some of them saying that the government seemed to use the institutions such as uh, the security, police, and then the judiciary to clamp down on civil, civil liberties, including free speech and opponents of the administration, who you described as the minority. How do you respond to such, Mr. President? The, in my understanding of civil society was that um, I would have my own means of living, means of living. I am a farmer, I am a lawyer, I am a doctor. That's how I earn a living. But somehow I get a passion for something. For orphans, for something, something. And I make a contribution there also. But I'm not paid. I'm not paid for that. No, even, even when I raise money, Money is for to, to deal with the, the disadvantaged uh, people. That's what civil society in, I had should be. But now, the civil society of, of, of Africa, especially here in Uganda, which I know, are these young people who are not employed. Now, they are hired by foreign, foreign uh, interests using even government money, money of foreign governments, to come and agitate for something. So how can you call those civil society? They are, they are employed by external forces. 
Mr. President, during the few elections that I have monitored in Uganda, your opponents say Mr. President has been in power since 1986. What at all does he want to achieve that he hasn't achieved? Uh, what does he want to do? Children born since 1986 have known only one leader and one leader only, President Yuri Boseveni. They said it is about time Mr. President goes to his farm, takes care of his grandchildren, and then leave it to the young generation to continue what he has built. How do you respond to them, Mr. President? Well, I thought those people were Democrats. I thought they were Democrats because that, that's a decision that is taken by the electorate. The electorate, if, first of all, the, the, the problem we have is that all those actors have no mission. They just want power. Our, our, our understanding is the what. What is to be done? Because if you answer that the what is to be done, uh, and you look at our four principles, if we have done something on the patriotism, good. That's why we have got some good results. That's why Uganda is not a failed state. That's why we don't, we don't have the UN here to guard us, to defend us, or, or France to, to, to bring troops here to defend us as if, as if we are no, there are no people here. Uh -huh. Uh, so that is an achievement. But how about integration? You remember integration we have. Uh -huh. So integration, uh, how about socioeconomic transformation? We have moved. We have moved, for instance, the, uh, the, the richest rate is 76% now. It used to be 43%. Uh, so when they say, what has he not? What has he? What did he want to achieve that he has not achieved? There are so many things that have not. We have not achieved our our movement. Like for instance, okay, the the literacy rate now is seventy six percent, but the jobs are not yet enough for the, all, all these people. And we are struggling with that. Integration, we are struggling with that. So then, because of that long uh, p uh, time mission, we ask the question, if you have got such big issues to deal with, to handle, you have achieved some, others you have not yet achieved, but you aim at them. Is it wise to have, as they say, in uh, on the sea, when they are ru running the ship, all hands on, on board, everybody in the ship, all, all the staff come and, and, and contribute? Or is it correct to say, uh -uh, although we have not achieved all our aims, some of the actors, you go, we, we don't need you, because, uh, because we have been around for too long. For us, we say, please, it is the mission that determines the, the who. If we reach a, a stage where we say we don't need all these elders, good because we have achieved our mission. So that argument is really uh, between the uh, mission-oriented people and other people I just uh, want, I don't know what, I don't know what, what they want. We, we don't accept that argument. Well, Kenneth, you heard the president. He doesn't accept that argument that he stayed in power for too long. The opposition argue that he stayed for too long. He is the third longest African leader coming after, the, after Teodoro Obiang Nguema Mbazogo of Equatorial Guinea and then Paul Bia of Cameroon. President Museveni is the third. Your thoughts on his argument? Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm going to say two things here. 
First, I will disagree with him, and secondly, I will agree with him. Let me start with a disagreement. It is not true or valid to argue that he is the only one with a vision for Uganda. You know, there are many other competent Ugandans who can equally carry out whatever he is saying. Uh, and I think uh, there is a price to democracy. The majority in parliament, are, you know, from his party, the National Resistance Movement, NRM. So, of course, they voted for those constitutional amendments to allow him to continue. That's the price of democracy. The majority take the, take the day. Uh, but it's not, in my view, it's not correct to say that he's the only one with that vision. There are many capable U Ugandans who can equally carry out that vision uh, with him or without him. Um, now, to agree with him, on the other hand, uh, I want to agree that, yes, when you have multi-party politics, there are a lot of opportunists and speculators. Okay, you're going to have somebody who's going to tell you, if you vote me into office at 14 hours, the local currency will pick up. Okay? Uh, someone will come and tell you, if you vote me into power, immediately I'll sell the presidential jet because my prede predecessor was all over flying. I won't be doing that. But the moment he gets into power, he gets on that jet, he's having a good time. And he'll tell you, well, this is not a priority. I want to talk about other things. Mm. So I, I somewhat, uh, some, sometimes say, you know, on social media, in my commentaries, I said, people are not honest. So you, we see this a lot in politics. We've had politicians who've said, if you vote me into power in 90 days, I will deliver X, Y, Z. They are voted into power. Those 90 days came, they changed the argument. So his, President Museveni is right. You would have a lot of opportunities trying to occupy the space. Okay, but it's up to the electorate, and that's where civic education comes in, to really be able to discern and understand and scrutinize uh, the candidates that, that are coming before them. Now, the challenge that we have in a lot of African states is that Uganda, for example, has more than 20 political parties. Most of these countries have so many political parties. And you can see, basically, you've got characters who don't even meet the minimum of being a school prefect. You know, I asked one, one of the political leaders, yeah. if you have one objective, and yes. one objective only, to wrestle power from President Museveni, why don't you come together as opposition leaders and, and challenge him? Sometimes what happens is you will find the opposition will get into an alliance of convenience because they've got a common enemy. But as soon as they wrestle power from the incumbent, they win the elections, you begin to see problems start to emerge. It's like, you know, uh, you know hyenas wrestling the carcass from a lion. After the lion is gone, then they start fighting amongst themselves. We've seen that a lot. Um, so, and the reason for that is very simple. These are opportunistic policies. They are not based on ideology. If you have a common ideology, it's very easy to remain united. But because you went into it for position and hunger to fill your stomach. So if you're not given a job, you leave the alliance. And this is African politics. That's what it is. The, the, the other part of it is, do these opposition politicians right. often overpromise? They call them candy men when they are campaigning because they promise everything to everybody to any place they go to, when they are elected, it's a different ball game altogether. Cajoleries is the name of politics, especially in Africa, making false promises. Uh, we've seen it over and over. Um, in Naya, for example, let me take an example of Zambia. In 1991, um, when President Kaunda lost elections, um, he was magnanimous enough to admit that he lost elections. He never held. And by the way, he actually opened up room for elections before his term came to end. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have never taken that into account, so we must give him credit uh, you know, for, mm -hmm. for having helped Zambia transition. The MMD promised so many things, uh, privatizing and so forth, but the infrastructure really just went down, the economy shrunk. Uh, yes, the privatized, there was a huge cost on the state subsidizing the state enterprises and so forth, and that was a big time of structure adjustment programs and so forth. But really, the infrastructure that Kaunda set up in terms of you know, things like uh, rural development, diversification of the economy, export promotion policies, import substitution. He had those in place. Okay. Now, fast forward, you know, you see this in other countries as well where people promise so many things when they come to power. And then within a year, people are impatient. They want to see what you promised them. Mm -hmm. Because you said at 14 hours, the local currency will change. You said you're going to sell the presidential jet. You haven't sold it. You're still riding on it. So tell us, what's going on here? What has changed? Because these are things you promised us. You told us, if I appoint my cabinet, wait and see who I'm going to appoint. And they're watching. Is this the best you can give us? You know, that's why sometimes when you make promise, make realistic promises, not just promises for the sake of getting into power.
Thank you very much, uh, Kenneth. We'll come back to you again. Let's go to my discussion with Orie Mieku, a Uganda-based researcher for Human Rights Watch, who talks about President Museveni's human rights record. So the report is called I Only Need Justice, and it documents uh, unlawful detention by security forces uh, in Uganda. Uh, this is something that has been happening for a very long time. Uh, we talk about and document uh, security forces, being the police, the military, and other officials uh, arresting people uh, from their workplaces, their homes, and taking them to places, for the most part, that are not authorized by the law for people to be detained at, and holding them for months at end, and subjecting them to a range of different uh, forms of torture, including beatings, including uh, being having electric currents applied to their skin, uh, and as well as sexual violence, uh, including rape. Uh, and our report talks about how those things happen, but also what the experiences of people who went through these experiences and have now returned and have now been released, what they are going through now. And what, what we found was that they, they are facing a number of challenges, especially in obtaining justice. But Oriem, the official government position is that torture is not uh, a policy of, of, of the government. Yeah. yeah. Well, the president has said that he doesn't condone torture. Other high-ranking officials have said that these acts are committed by rogue officials. Uh, they may say that, and they have said that for a long time, but the fact remains that security officials that are affiliated with the Ugandan government have been committing these abuses for a very long time. Uh, our report, you know, documents cases from 2018 up to late 2021, but this has been happening for very many years. Um, I think that if the government really doesn't condone these these abuses, then they should end them immediately today. They should they should stop today, but they, they haven't. And I think that reflects on the fact that Actually, in, in a lot of ways, the, the government does condone torture. President Museveni told viewer recently in an interview that torture doesn't work and that he has been trying hard to explain to some of the employees in the police uh, that they should not torture people and that he has a dozy of investigations going on uh, to punish the perpetrators and all that. Why don't you think this is enough to try, as part of the effort, to uh, limit or stop torture in Uganda? Well, first of all, you, it's not enough to just say it's it's wrong uh, or that it shouldn't happen. You have to see real consequences when people commit torture, when people arbitrarily arrest uh, individuals, when uh, when people are unlawfully det detained, which is illegal and in the in Ugandan law and in international law, we have to see that the things that are supposed to happen, that is people actually being held accountable, being prosecuted uh, for these abuses, we should we need to see that actually happen. And that has not been the case in Uganda. There's been little to no accountability for hundreds and hundreds of cases of of these uh, abductions and, and, and disappearances and torture. Um, and I think that's the reason why um, it just, those statements are just, it's just, it, it just it's just hot air because it, 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 we haven't seen the actual consequences for these abuses. Is Human Rights Watch going to engage the government about this report, as well as probably the Human Rights Commission in Uganda, uh, designated by the Constitution to ensure the protection and respect of human rights in the country? We have engaged the, the government. Uh, we've drawn attention to this report. Uh, we've had several meetings with government officials. Uh, we also invited them to the launch of the report today. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have an opportunity to hear from them today, but we will continue to engage with them as we continue to, as we continue to advocate for the justice needs of the victims that we document in the report. That was Oriem Mnyeko, a Uganda-based researcher for Human Rights Watch. Now, Kenneth, you've heard Oriem Mnyeko. Uh, he works for the Human Rights Watch. They come up with yearly reports about uh, the protection of human rights or the respect of human rights in Uganda. And he forced the government that the government isn't doing enough. 
The government says we are doing enough, we are disciplining people, we are investigating. The president himself told me that he has a dossier, like you saw in the interview, of people that he's trying to have his people investigate and then perhaps the perpetrators punished. Your thoughts? It's, it's, it's very common, uh, those type of scenarios um, in many parts of the world. Um, let me take a recent one because there were two, fundamental, two major elections last year in Africa, in southern eastern Africa, the Zambia one and the Uganda one, very similar parallels. One of the reasons why PF government lost power is that there was a lot of indiscipline. You had all these cadres who were misbehaving, mistreating people, you know, all sorts of stuff. There was no discipline, okay? And so people were disen disen dis disenfranchised, people were not happy about that. So ultimately, it was a protest vote. Mm -hmm. There was corruption, which was not being addressed, okay? So discipline is a very important thing, especially in leadership. You can be a very nice leader, a very nice person as a gentleman, but you must, as a leader, provide discipline to the machinery and to the state systems. There was no discipline under PF, so they lost. It was a protest vote, okay? So this is exactly what you're seeing in Uganda. Eventually, people get tired, and you can't stop it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a revolution. They've got the power of the ballot. Even if you try to rig elections, if they are just overwhelmingly frustrated, like happened in Zambia, you're gonna lose. But Kenneth, some NRM, NRM supporters I spoke with in Uganda yeah. were telling me that some of these politicians purposely right. try to create disaffection, sometimes threaten national security on TV uh, with rhetoric that are unbecoming, they said. But the supporters of the opposition group say this is a free country. The constitution guarantees freedom of speech and expression. Uh, so we can say what we want to say. But how far do we go? So it's like a ping pong, pretty yeah. much. One thing that um, President, I think President Museveni understands very well, and I give him credit for that, he understands the politics and how to work around them. There are two elements that help you win legitimacy and stay in power. Use of force which he seems to be heavy-handed, or use of ideology, propaganda, mm -hmm. and so forth. We didn't attack Ukraine. They're just telling lies. You know, you want to drum up that propaganda. So how you use ideology, or how you use uh, uh, power, force, or you can use both. So that has really helped him. But like I said, it can only go to a certain extent from a Marxist point of view, once the contradiction between the forces of production and the relations of production hit the peak the revolution comes in. You know, I was surprised when I went to parts of the country outside Kampala. Right. And, and I saw the opposition gaining some momentum. Right. But then the president still has a lot of support there too. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised yes. because I thought from what the reports we've been hearing right. that a president is really unpopular in right. other parts of, of the country, but it, it looks like it's a 50-50 now. The interesting part is that when you talk to intellectuals or middle class, you know, uh, these are guys, some of them don't even vote, okay? They, they are drinking whiskey in the, at the golf club and so forth. Okay, these are not the usual voters, you know, so you have to understand the constituency that comprises the majority of the voters, rural women, you know, the, the, the uneducated and, and so forth, the poor people. Those are the guys who are going to be in the queues waiting to vote, okay? But there, will, there does come a time when even the intellectuals join the movement. They're just fed up, okay? And that's what we saw, for example, in Zambia recently. Um, you know, everybody sort of moved in. Uh, so, yes, it's true that sometimes you can have rhetoric coming from people who are not even voters, and that really doesn't count. Uh, and I think President Museveni is very astute to some... If you look at his history, he was, you know, a military sort of general, mm -hmm. fought in the Liberation War. He understands the psychology and the psyche of the masses and how it's working. But that can only hold for so long, not forever. 36 long years. <laughs> 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 All right, Kenneth. Yeah. Uh, Sarah Biriti is the executive director of the Center for Constitutional Governance, a civil society group in Uganda. She disagrees with President Museveni's assertion that civil society groups in the East African country are agents of wealthy Western nations who are seeking to take advantage of Uganda's weaknesses. For a while now, President Museven and his government have been calling civil society as agents of change. It's a, a targeted blackmail, and the state bases on the source of funding 
which CSOs use through diplomatic missions and other corporations that are in partnership with the government of Uganda, as well as the people of Uganda. It is important to note that our current budget is more, more than half of our current budget is funded by donors. The same donors that fund both our recurrent budget and 100% of our development budget are the same partners that work with civil society organizations in Uganda. But the regime uses the narrative because civil society gets funding from the same partners that they get their funding to blackmail civil society and put them against the people as if they pursue foreign agenda or objectives that they are not registered to do by the same government that he, he heads. Now, Basera, some NRM supporters that I spoke with are of the view that if you are real civil society groups, then you should be able to fund your own activities. President Museveni pretty much said the same thing. And they believe that some of your activities seek to undermine the territorial integrity of the government of Uganda, basically seeking regime change. Uh, don't you think their concerns are legitimate? Why can't he first fund his own government? The current budget, recurrent budget, he can only fund 44%. 56 is donor funded. If he had the poor country where people are impoverished for 36 years and he cannot raise enough tax, fund his own recurrent budget, how can he expect entities whose, who, whose workers are similarly impoverished to fund their own work? That is the hypocrisy of the highest order. Sarah, let me ask you about constitutionalism and the rule of law. Recently, during the pandemic, um, opposition groups during the recent general election campaigned in spite of COVID-19 measures. The president was not happy about that because he felt that the actions of the opposition during campaigning uh, basically became a harbinger or a, a, a platform to increase the spread of the coronavirus. What is your take on that? At the beginning of the pandemic, Uganda had three options to take in as far as the 2021 elections were concerned. The first option was to declare a state of emergency and postpone elections. Under that scenario that is provided for under Article 110 of our Constitution, the president would have lost power to the speaker because he cannot extend his mandate beyond five years. So he feared that option. The second option would have been to declare a state of emergency and then enact the Elections Emergency Act. That emergency act would have provided for clear avenues under which elections would have been conducted in the pandemic. That option was also left alone. So we ran elections under draconian regulations manufactured under the draconian archaic public order management public health act that was enacted in the colonial era of 1935. these rules were very twisted and unfair against the opposition in uganda the president used the state machinery have to meet organized groups funded by the state and the campaign in a cordial manner. But we also saw his agents holding rallies in town, including rallies by musicians that were campaigning for him, which violated the COVID regulations. But no security officer shot and killed people in the rallies that were organized by President Museveni's agents. It was an election shrouded by double standards, hypocrisy, and unfairness against the opposition. That was Sarah Birete, Executive Director at the Center for Constitutional Governance in Uganda. Now, Kenneth, you heard 
uh, Dr. Sarah Bereti. Well, what are your thoughts about his, her concerns about, you know, being labeled as agent of the West seeking regime change, trying to undermine the territorial integrity of Uganda, among other issues she raised? Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Um, like I said, I always look at the pros and cons of every scenario. Mm -hmm. um, there's no one right answer. In this situation, she has some good valid points. President Museveni also has some valid points. Uh, and let, let me elucidate a little bit. There are NGOs and civil society organizations which are funded to influence change of policy domestically. Right. You know, that's, that's, that's a known fact. Mm -hmm. okay. At the same time, we have legitimate CSOs and NGOs who are doing good things on the ground. Mm -hmm. okay. So we, we cannot just wholesomely condemn President Museveni. No, that's not right. At the same time, we cannot agree with him wholesomely, but we should be somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's got some, some points there. And I want to touch on another point that President Museveni made, which is very valid, especially for Africa. The issue of tribe, ethnicity, and sectarian policy, politics. Mm -hmm. This has really messed up our politics on the continent, okay? Um, nobody, no leader whatsoever will ever agree that their mandate is being pushed on sectarian politics or tribal ethnicity issues. Mm -hmm. You just have to see it. No one, a thief will never tell you that, yes, I'm a thief. You mm -hmm. know, you just have to look for the evidence, right. okay? The, if the evidence is there. And that's a very poor way of governing. You cannot last in power if you begin to project that biasness in society. People can see it, the electorate. But, but, but Kenneth, that is what some are accused of doing by dividing the electorate so they will have a block of their supporters. And some would say, when I come back or when I come to power, you should not expect any development in your area because I know where my votes came from. You have to be a strategist, not a, a tactician. A strategist, strategist is long-term thinking. You have to look at the demographics, the numbers. Even if you're going to play the politics of tribe, what are the numbers? Can you carry the day at the end of the day in terms of people who are supporting you? Right. If you are from a minority group, you are taking a chance. Mm. If you are from a majority group, maybe you can survive, but it's not a good way. Have a nationalist agenda. And this is what we saw with uh, people like um, uh, the, the, the old man, Kenneth Kaunda. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it was a national one agenda. One nation, one Zambia. One nation, one Zambia. This right. is what we, call with, we saw with people like Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. This is what we saw with people like uh, uh, in Dar es Salaam, what was uh, Nyerere. Nyerere. Right. Okay? That type of politics which transcends ethnicity and transcends parochial sort of insular mm -hmm. type of thinking, a global perspective, you know, uh, and even your, in your agenda, your foreign policy has to be well articulated. Don't just focus on dealing with your op opposition locally. Okay, in Kuruma, in Ghana, mm -hmm. although his domestic policy was troubled, mm -hmm. but his foreign policy was very sound. Mm -hmm. He championed the non-aligned movement with the Kaundas. Mm -hmm. The issue of what's going on between Russia and Ukraine today, for example, what's, what's the position of African states? They, they are pretty much on the fence, except a few that, you know... That's why the right. issue of non-aligned movement is now, they are trying to revive it. Right. You know, because you don't want to get entangled in some of this, these messes. Uh, we saw what happened in DRC in 1961 when Patrice Lumumba was taken out. Mm -hmm. uh, he was hoping the Soviets would support him. Uh, but somehow Brussels, London, and Washington were not in agreement. Before we go, um, Kenneth, briefly, colonial era laws being used uh, by government. I mean, in some parts of Southern Africa, they say they are archaic laws. You cannot insult the president. Or if you criticize the president and they think you are insulting them, then you go to jail. Briefly, 10 seconds. The thing is, those who are in the oppositions will always condemn laws which work against them. When they get into power, they will never repeal those laws. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kenneth. Thank you for watching our special edition of Straight Talk Africa on Uweri Museveni, one of the longest ruling heads of state in Africa. Please follow our conversation on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Biza Klote. Good evening, Africa.